Amen. Well, we've already been blessed tonight to meet with Billy and Randy, and uh, we've had a time of questioning. Uh, the ordination council met tonight, and we spent a couple of hours, about an hour and a half really, uh, just questioning them, encouraging them, praying with them, and then we broke bread and had a meal together. And uh, here at the end of our service, I'm going to ask those who were a part of the ordination council uh, to come, and, and they're going to stand up here, and then we're going to have Randy and Billy uh, to kneel before us, and, uh, and we're going to come through. Those who were a part of the ordination council, we're going to come by, lay hands over them, on them, and pray for them and their spouses. Tonight's message is, is one that I, I really wanted to be special. And what I mean by that is when you go to the Bible, when you come to an ordination service, um, there are typical passages that you usually hear at an ordination service. And most of those, most of those sermons uh, come out of 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy. Uh, most of the sermons that we hear at an ordination service go something like this. Let no one look down on you upon your youth. And those are, that's a great message. Or often in an ordination service, we'll hear, we'll hear a sermon on the qualifications of a pastor. And those, those are great messages as well. Or often we'll hear the charge to, to preach the word in season and out of season. And those are all great messages. But that is not the passage of scripture that the Lord gave me for you tonight. And so I would like for you to open your Bibles tonight to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want us to look at verse 26. And I'm going to read all the way through chapter 2 verse 5. 1 through 5. But let's start there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. And I want you to pay attention to every word here. It says, brothers, consider your calling. Not many are wise from a human perspective. Not many powerful. Not many of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen the world's foolish things to shame the wise. And God has chosen the world's weak things to shame the strong. God has chosen the world's insignificant and despised things, the things viewed as nothing, so he might bring to nothing the things that are viewed as something. So that no one can boast in his presence. But for him you are in Christ Jesus. Who for us became wisdom from God. As well as righteousness, sanctification and redemption. In order that as it is written. The one who boasts must boast in the Lord. And the main passage for tonight's message is chapter 2 verses 1 through 5. When I came to you, brothers, announcing the testimony of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and power, so that your faith might not be based on man's wisdom, but on God's power. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless the preaching of your word tonight. May these truths seek sink, I'm sorry, sink deep into the hearts of these men. May they also sink deep into our hearts as well. And in Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. We come together tonight to acknowledge what God is doing in the lives of, of these two families here, um, specifically Billy and Randy. We, we, we're here tonight to acknowledge the call of God that he has placed on your life. We are not the ones who have called you into the ministry. God is the one who has called you into the ministry. And tonight, this ordination service and the laying on of hands is our way of saying that we acknowledge what God is doing in your life. It's evident to us. And so as the church, we want to give our approval 
Uh, so the evidence of God's call that we see in your life. When you were first called by God, you were called to salvation. You both gave your salvation testimony tonight. And by the way, this message is for all of us, but I'm going to be looking at them, uh, okay? This is a charge to them, so I'm going to be looking at them most of the time. But your first call was a call to salvation. You gave your salvation testimony tonight in our question and answer time. And there was a time when you were both dead in sin, separated from God, and God, by grace, called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That is the call to salvation. The call to salvation is when God called you out of the world, out of the kingdom of darkness, and he placed you in the kingdom of his beloved son. So he called you out of the world, and he called you into the church. But then there was your second call. And this is where the Lord has called you out of the church in order to lead. Your first call out of the world into the church. Your second call is out of the congregation in order to be a leader. And it's a special call. It's a call that you ought to have much respect for and reverence for. And it's a, it's a call that, that your wife must experience as well. I know that you both have affirmed that. And so that's what we're here tonight to, to celebrate with you is the fact that God has called you out of the world, into the church, and then out of the congregation into a position of leadership. This ministry, this calling is not to be entered into lightly. This calling needs to be kept in perspective. Paul says there in those first few verses, he says that God chose the foolish things. Don't think too much of yourself. Right? God says that he chose the foolish things. That I love you, but that's you. I, you know what I'm saying? But that's me too. Okay? God says, I, I chose the foolish things to shame the wise. And God has chosen the world's weak things to shame the strong. That's what God says. I, I've chosen you for this purpose. The world sees you as insignificant the world sees you as despised and he says I've taken those things which are viewed as nothing so that oh this is good so he might bring to nothing the things that are viewed as something why does he do this why does he take the foolish things? Why does he take the insignificant things? Why does he take the despised things? Why? So that no one can boast in his presence. You get that? There's no grounds for boasting here. There's no room for pride. God says foolish, unwise, insignificant, despised. But I chose you. And then he goes on to say, but for him you are in Christ Jesus. I like this. He says, I chose the foolish. We've already got that. But he says, I've chosen you and you are in Christ Jesus. Who for us has become wisdom. Who is your wisdom? Wisdom. Christ. Who is the source of wisdom? Christ. Who has become wisdom from God as well as righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. In order that, and he repeats it as it is written, the one who boasts must boast in the Lord. Don't boast in yourself. You're boasting. It's okay to boast, but your boasting is to be in the Lord. There's nothing special. There was nothing uh, about you that caused God to choose you. Nothing special that caused God to set you apart for the gospel ministry. God simply chose you out of his good nature. And therefore there's no room for pride. No room for boasting. Our boasting is to be in the Lord. I want to give you three things tonight that I believe ought to... That, that, that should... Uh, that I believe uh, stresses the, 
the, pin, the principles that should characterize your ministry. The first thing I want to talk about tonight is the content of your ministry. The content of your ministry. And it comes here, if you'll look there in chapter 2, verse 1. He says, when I came to you, brothers, announcing the testimony of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. And here it is. And this is the verse. We're going to give you some good study Bibles tonight as a gift. Okay, I'm just going to let that out of the bag. I'm sure you knew it was coming. But this is the verse that I wrote in your Bible. Verse 2. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The content of your ministry is the gospel. Period. The content of your ministry is the gospel. As a matter of fact, if you look at verse 1, he says, When I came to you, brothers, announcing the testimony. In other words, that word testimony could also be translated witness. When I came to you proclaiming as a witness. A witness is someone who is called into a courtroom in order to give an account of what he or she has experienced. The judge is not asking for their opinion. The judge is asking for the facts. Tell us what you saw. Tell us what you heard. Tell us what you have experienced. And that is what a witness is to proclaim. And that is what Paul says. Paul says, I am here to proclaim what I have seen, what I have heard, what I have experienced. And what I have seen and whatever, what I have heard and what I have experienced is the life-changing power of the gospel. Therefore, he says, I am determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, Paul says, that is the content of my ministry. The content of my ministry is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, we are, we are acknowledging that God has called you into the gospel of ministry. He's not, he hasn't called you into uh, psychology. That's for others. He hasn't called you into politics. That's for others. He has called you into the gospel ministry. You're not to stand in this pulpit and be a psychologist. You're not to stand in this pulpit and be a politician. You're to stand and you are to be a preacher and a proclaimer of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's called you into. Again, all those other things I spoke of, they serve a purpose. And praise God for those who are serving in that position. But specifically, your call. The content of your ministry. As you're being called into the gospel ministry. And what's amazing to me about this verse is that Paul taught a lot of things, didn't he? I mean, if you study through 1 Corinthians, I mean, Paul talks about the spiritual gifts. He talks about worship in the church. I mean, Paul talks about a lot. He talks about love. He talks about end times. I mean, Paul talks about a lot of things in 1 Corinthians beyond the gospel. But here he says, I chose to know nothing among you except the gospel. What does he mean by that? Because I know he talked about a lot of other stuff, right? He talked about a lot of other things. So what does he mean when he says, I was determined to know nothing among you except the gospel? Wait a minute, Paul. You preached more than that. You taught more than that. So what does this statement mean? Here's what it means. Everything that Paul taught, everything that Paul preached, everything that Paul did was done through the lenses of the gospel. Everything that Paul did was for the gospel. So here is the charge. Is the gospel is the content of your ministry. So you are to study, you are to grow, and you are to focus, and you are to meditate upon the gospel every single day of your life. When the gospel is priority to you, because you know what the gospel says? The gospel says this. Is that when you were unloving, God loved you anyway. Is that when you were dead in your sin, God chose to send his son to die in your place. Jesus died in your place. He was buried and he rose from the dead. 
And the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel, is the greatest demonstration of the love of God that we have. And when you focus on the gospel, you are reminded that you don't have to earn the love of God. You are reminded that God loves you just as you are. So when you work in the ministry, we don't work and we don't do things in order to earn God's love. I don't preach because I'm trying to earn God's love. I don't go out and witness because I'm trying to earn God's love. I don't prepare lessons because I'm trying to earn God's love. I preach and I prepare and I study and I minister to people because I know that I already have God's love and that makes me want to love him that much more. And that is the truth of the gospel. Guys, if the gospel is priority in your life, then you're going to love your wife as Christ loved the church. And you're going to raise your children to love God with all of their heart, with all of their soul, with all of their mind, and with all of their strength. If the gospel is your priority, then you're always going to have the best interest of others before your own. If the gospel is your priority, you're not only going to look after your own interest, but you're going to look after the interest of others. If the gospel is your priority, then you're not going to put church before your family. The gospel says keep your priorities in the right place. God first. Wives then your children, then the church. Don't let anything come in between that. So what is the content of your ministry? The gospel. Paul says, listen, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Your, God, your ministries ought to be gospel-saturated. Your lives ought to be gospel-centered. And everything that you do ought to be about leading people to encounter Jesus who is revealed in the gospel. So the content of your ministry, it is the gospel. There's a lot of people who forgot that. There's a lot of people who, who, who lose sight of that. And I pray that you two men never will. And I pray that your wives will help you. And by the way, the wives are a helpmate. You know why? Why? Because when we're tempted to be prideful because we're leaders, God uses them to bring us back down to reality. Amen. Mine's real good at that. A.W. Pink says this. It calls for courage. The gospel ministry calls for courage. Courage of a high order. For a preacher to scorn all novelties and disdain the contemptuous sneers of his fellows... That he is behind the times because he declares only the counsel of God. To be ordained into the gospel ministry is to dedicate the rest of your life to proclaiming and teaching the truths that are found in this word. And you are going to be ridiculed and you are going to be snared or sneered and you are going to be disdained for this. It takes courage. Faithfulness to God. The character of your ministry. The content of your ministry is the gospel. The character of your ministry. If you'll go back to verse 2, he says, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness, in fear, in much trembling. My speech and my, pro my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom but with a demonstration of the Spirit and power. Notice the words that he uses to describe his ministry. He says, I came to you, number one, weakness, fear, trembling. That is a picture of humility. What is the character of your ministry? Humility. It's not about you. When John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness and he was calling people to repent and to follow in baptism, the religious leaders of the day, they begin to come to John the Baptist and they begin to say, who are you? Tell us about yourself. In other words, they were wanting all the focus to be on John. They were trying to draw all the attention to John the Baptist. And John said, listen, I'm just a voice crying out in the wilderness to make straight the way. It's not about me. It's about the one who's coming after me. The one whose sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. The greatest picture of humility is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. 
And Philippians chapter 2 where it says, Have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, and being made into the likeness of man, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. For this reason, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him a name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What a great example of humility that the God of the universe who spoke all things into existence chose to humble himself and become a man, a servant who went to the cross and died in our place. The character of your ministry? Humility. You're to be humble. You're to realize, just as Paul said, how did Paul describe himself? He chose the foolish things, the insignificant things, the despised things things. Paul says, that's who I am. In Christ, my, my wisdom is not found in myself. Paul says, my wisdom is found in, in Christ. So therefore, when I boast, I boast in, I boast in Christ. What, what an attitude of humility. It was John Bunyan who said, he that is down, and I keep this written down in the front of my Bible, so let me, it's important to me. This is not just some quote I pulled out of the air just for you tonight, okay? This, po- this, this, this quote is so important that it's written in the front of my Bible, and I want you to hear it. John Bunyan. He that is down needs fear no fall. He that is low, no pride. He that is humble ever shall have God to be his guide. When I was in football, believe it or not, I was an offensive lineman. A right tackle. Back then, I weighed 205 pounds, but that's still small for a lineman, isn't it? And my coach would always tell me, he said, Blake, stay low. Stay low. Because, Blake, if you stay low, you can get leverage on those big guys, right? Stay low, stay low, stay low, and you can win the battle. And my word to you this evening is stay low, stay low, stay low. Because humility is the character of your ministry. The gospel is the content, humility is the character. What is the concern of your ministry? What is the concern of your ministry? Go back to verse 4. He says, My speech and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom. In other words, he wasn't trying to get people to look at himself. He says, listen, it's not about the messenger. It's, it's about the message. It's not about the preacher. It's about the one who's being proclaimed. Paul says, I'm not up here trying to uh, persuade you through my intellect. Paul was a very intellectual person. But Paul says, I'm pushing my intellect to the side because I don't, want you to be, I don't want you to be persuaded by my intellect. I want you to be persuaded by the, by the Spirit's power. So look at the verse. Verse 4, my speech and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with the demonstration of the Spirit and power. Why? Verse 5, here it is. So that your faith, he's talking to the church, those who have been converted, so that your faith might... Uh, not be based on man's wisdom, but on God's power. So here it is. Hear me now. What is the concern of your ministry? Genuine salvations. Genuine salvations. Paul says, I did not come with you, to you with intellectual head knowledge. I did not come to you in trying to show you how smart I am. 
I did not come to you with persuasive words. I did not come in order to manipulate you to make a decision. I came to you just preaching Jesus, even in my weakness, so that your conversion would prove itself to be genuine. The concern of your ministry, men, is to lead the lost into a genuine saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Therefore, all the cute things that people want to do in order to play upon the emotions of people, in order to get them to make a decision, must be done away with. There is no room whatsoever for manipulation. No room whatsoever for scared tactics. No room whatsoever for playing upon the emotions of the people. God has called you simply to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with integrity and trust him for the results. Make no, persuade, make no mistake about it. We are to persuade people to come to Jesus. That's biblical. We are to persuade. We are to teach. And we are to preach with passion but we're not to manipulate we are to preach and to teach and to share with integrity so that people will genuinely be converted and not make some type of shallow emotional decision which amounts to nothing that's what Paul says so that your faith might not be based on man's wisdom but on God's power so the content of your ministry, the gospel. The character of your ministry, humility. The concern of your ministry, genuine salvation. It was John Wesley who said, You have nothing to do but to save souls. Therefore, spend and be spent in this work. It was Charles Spurgeon who said, our highest calling is to grow in our knowledge of Christ in order to make him known to others. The French Foreign Legion has a motto. Here it is. I thought it was appropriate. You want to hear it? Are you listening? By the way, I have this one written down in my Bible too. If I stumble... Hold me up. If I fall, pick me up. If I retreat, shoot me. <laughs> There's no retreat, guys. No retreat. My final words to you, stay low. Stay low. And wives, you help them. Stay low. What we're going to do now is I'm going to ask these men to come and to kneel down here at the altar. So would you two men come and I'm going to ask for your wives to stand behind you. And I'm going to explain this, what this, what this symbolizes, what this pictures. He's low, isn't he? Because that is the character of his ministry, isn't it? Huh? Low. Low. It's a sign of submission. It's a sign of humility. And that's what this represents. The wives standing behind them is a picture of their support. Realizing that without the support of their wives, they have no ministry at all. And so we have a, pic we have a picture of submission and a picture of support. Amen? And it's a beautiful picture, isn't it? I'm going to ask for those men who were a part of the ordination council to go ahead and make their way forward at this time and and uh, we're going to make a line right here. Just go ahead and come forward, gentlemen. And now what we're going to do is we're going to enter into the time of the laying on of hands. All these men that you see up here are all ordained uh, ministers of the gospel. Either retired or actively serving. And so they served as our ordination council. And they're going to come and we're going to have the time of laying on of hands now, praying over, over these men and their wives and over their ministry. And I'm going to ask for Marty to go first because I want to go last, okay? All right. And I want to see their hair all messed up by the time I get there, okay? All right.
Amen. Praise the Lord. It's a pretty humbling experience, isn't it? Yeah. Your hair doesn't look near as, <laughs> as GQ as it did before you. <laughs> that was really my goal for this, but uh, just stay right there for a moment. What we'd like to do is to present both of you men now with the ESV, ESV Study Bible. And uh, Randy, here's yours. Okay, there you go. And Billy, there's yours. And we do have your ordination papers, your certificate, our certificate, and we'll be getting those filled out, and, and we will give them to you. Amen? Praise the Lord, church. Amen? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> 